Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mamluks. I'm Mahin and I'm here with my co-hosts, Sheikh Amr Saeed and Sim. And today I've got an old friend calling in from Abu Dhabi, Justin Parrott. Justin is a librarian and researcher at the New York University in Abu Dhabi. He got his bachelor's degree from Otterbein University, and he also is currently working on his master's at the University of Wales, right, Justin? Is that right, in Islamic studies? That's right. Okay. Is there, is there an Abu Dhabi branch there? Um, well, I have my master's degree in library science, and to complement that, I'm getting a master's by research from the University of Wales. So they've approved my research project, and I, I just have to finish it, and I'll be done. Okay. Inshallah. Well, first of all, Jazakallah Khair uh, for coming on the show. Um, you know, I was really hoping to have you on at some point, and um, we felt like with some of the stuff you've been publishing recently, it'd be a good opportunity for our listeners to get to know you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. You know, for those of you guys who don't, I mentioned he's an old friend. So Justin um, and I went to the same high school back in Dublin, Ohio. He was a freshman when I was a senior, and I remember, I remember your brother. I don't, remember, I don't because you were, you know, obviously. Uh, few years younger than me your brother drew i think he played football at, at Sayota high school if i recall right? Uh, right i think he was a year younger i think he was a junior when i was a senior and so it's funny how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sheikh amra like you know connects us to people that we may have crossed paths with in, in, an, in almost in another life so i remember in the early 2000s you know you and uh you remember An- andrew rogers who actually was in chicago um last year or so for a couple for law school and i connected with him became muslim um, and you basically see the, these two like suburban white kids, you know, just ba- baby face white kids becoming Muslim. And the next thing I know, you you went to Hajj with my my mom back in '04, and I think you worked with her at uh, to one of the schools down there in Columbus for for a little while. And so, and Justin's story is interesting because he actually his I think your dad's a pastor and your grandfather's a pastor. Is is that right? Uh, yeah, my my father and my grandfather were both pastors. Okay, so l- l- let's start about that. Let's talk about your background a little bit. Uh, we don't want to take up too much time on it, but just in, in brief, like how you got interested in Islam. You know, coming from Dublin, Ohio. Um, Dublin, Ohio is a very like for those of you in the Chicago area, it's like a Wheaton, Illinois, or Oak Brook, Illinois, very posh suburb. So, talk to us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in Islam. Um. So, like I said, my father was a minister and grew up learning uh, about Isa alayhi salam uh, in the Bible and going to church. And when I was about 17, uh, I was going through a difficult time in my life. I wanted to become more religious and I wanted to learn about Christianity um, beyond what you, what you learn in church. So I started reading the Bible on my own. Um, I went to college and when I was about 19... I uh, started to just get interested in all kinds of religions, different kinds of spiritual ideas. I was reading about, you know, all the Eastern religions and everything. And uh, Islam is the one that stuck out. Um, I read the Quran in the library. I got a translation. Uh, It wasn't the best one, but it's enough to get the message through. And uh, you're just amazed by some of the verses and um, the clarity of the theology and um, it just, the Quran just speaks to you in this very uh, visceral kind of deep way um, that even reading the translation, um, it's, it's very meaningful. And so um, at some point, I think I was 20, uh, it just had turned 20, I decided that I have to move forward in my spiritual life and I'm going to accept Islam. I'm going to become a Muslim. So I went to Masjid Omar down on the Ohio State campus and I made Shahada and I met and I met uh, Basil there, Brother Basil, and uh, met a lot of good friends there who uh, helped me learn the basics of Islam. And at the same time, I I uh, I got Andrew to come with me. about a week or two later. And um, alhamdulillah, he's still practicing and we're still practicing. And um, and I've just been learning Islam um, ever since then. Uh, Sheikh uh, Dr. Hussein Shawat, who was our imam for a time, uh, had, a, had a big impact on me and I learned a lot from him, learned a lot from his manners and from the way he managed the community. 
and um, just uh, just been continuing on that path, you know. And I'm here now in Abu Dhabi, uh, learning Arabic, getting farther along in the scholarly uh, scene with different people. And uh, I don't know, alhamdulillah, that's that's kind of it. We we mentioned earlier that you moved or you started working with the Yaqeen Institute uh, in, in some capacity. Can you describe some of your thought processes on why you chose to work with the Yaqeen Institute and uh, some of the problems that you may have identified in society that you're trying to tackle by choosing to work with them? Uh, well, it kind of began um, when uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman um, reached out to me by email. Um, at the time, I had it uh, my email up on my blog, and um, he liked some of the stuff that I had wrote and some of the work that I put out there. He asked me uh, some questions about some topics he was dealing with, uh, and that was like a, a year before Yaqeen started. And then uh, he contacted me again, and he said he wanted me to work on this project with him. Uh, and I was happy to do that. Um, I, I think he's a good uh, leader, good community leader. I think he's been doing a great job lately. And I'm really happy to, uh, to help him out. Um, I'm a volunteer, so I'm not an employee of the institution. So I, I do it on my weekends and in the evening when I have time. What are you uh, choosing to focus your energies on? Because I think, uh, from as I understand, Yaqeen is trying to tackle on uh, tackle many different attacks that are coming from, you know, Western society focused on Islam and uh, some of the different uh, things related to Islam, like for example, the attacks from atheism with regards to the existence of a creator, or more complex topics like jihad and whatnot. Uh, right. So he's got, he's assembled a diverse team and uh, we, we all communicate with each other and we help each other research our projects and we, we, we bring sources together. We uh, constructively critique, critique each other's work before it goes out there. Um, so I do, I've been in contact with a lot of my colleagues at Yafin and been helping them with their papers um, and everyone has a strength. Some people are focusing on the attacks from atheism, and some people are focusing on, you know, the the, uh, the issues like slavery and the history of Islam and things like that right. that are sort of used to malign the faith. So I, I give my uh, tips to them. Um, I'm letting other people handle those things. Um, he he. Uh, allowed me to lead the the first article uh, on the jihad issue. Right. Um, which I was I was happy to do, and it was just a summary of things that I had wrote um, previously on my blog, and um, and right now um, other people are taking up different projects, and uh, I'm still work awaiting. Uh, you know, things are still being consolidated in the, in how things are peer reviewed and so on, and and after this gets. Uh, after this gets this initial startup phase, uh, then I'll have more um, more things to contribute. No, no. Um, I read I read your article on jihad, and it it is a very academic article, and it seems like it's uh, intended towards a different audience. Um, thank you. How 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 do you uh, reconcile being able to write academic work and trying to also influence um, younger Muslims who may be able to, uh, who need some of that guidance too, that, that your article might might be a little, uh, might go over their heads. At or it's like, at the end of the day, we have like ADD here in America, right? You know, people don't have yeah. the patience to even like read an article, even though it, it isn't super long. Like it'll take you like what, five, like, 10 minutes maybe yeah. to read the article. But people are like, mm -hmm. we're in this Vine culture, right? Where you get like 10 seconds or 15 yeah. seconds. And, you know, people, and that, that, that's essentially like a why I think a lot of the reasons why someone like Donald Trump got elected president. Not, not to segue into it too much, but like because of the, the, the rhetoric is very like, you, you could say something like real crazy. Hey, build a wall. Boom. 10 feet higher. Bam. I'm down with that. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? So like, and, but a lot of the rhetoric from, you know, maybe Muslim kids who don't have the proper understanding of 
jihad. They don't have the time. They're, they're not. They're gonna be like, I'm gonna go play Call of Duty or something, and then, you know, his buddy said something. He's like, Oh, that makes sense. Let me go do this. So, I, well, yeah, that, that's kind of just a talk, a hmm. piggybacking on Sim's question, right? Yeah. So, um, so I write uh, at the undergraduate level, um, and I try to keep it scholarly in the sense that I am citing and um, documenting my sources in a scholarly manner. Uh, I'm addressing the scholarly uh, paradigms and frameworks and arguments that are out there. And I'm trying to do it in this in a simple yet accurate language. This last article was uh, was I think it was over 5000 words yeah. and um, which is pretty long. But uh, the topic is so deep and there's so much to be said about it. Right. That I was trying to make my point and then. Uh, respond to the three uh, biggest counter arguments that that I knew were coming, and um, and I didn't want to make it that much longer than that. Um, and and then the, some of the feedback that I got from it was that oh you didn't talk about this enough and you didn't talk about this and you didn't talk about this. Well, I had uh, you know I, I I didn't want it to go past eight thousand words and I didn't I didn't want to go that far anyway. <laughs> So um, I, I, I thought I really uh, tried to keep it as consistent. I don't think I wasted any space. Yeah. And um, Justin, when, when this topic yeah. starts, uh, um, whenever people want to talk about jihad, the problem I have with these, uh, a lot of the explanations related to this topic is that people take away from the meaning of jihad and they try to say, you know, they, they go to the actual linguistic meaning uh, of struggle. Well, which which mm-hmm. there is definitely uh, it fits into the the legal meaning the broader legal meaning of of, of, of fighting and or war in general. Um, can you explain what the distinction is between the two? Because a lot of people these days it seems like they want to just um, compartmentalize jihad into the word struggle and the, the linguistic meanings of it. Whereas there are broader legal meanings to it that we need to understand and we need to accept that this is part of our religion. Right. Um, so I think Ibn al-Qaim has a good piece where he discusses all the different kinds of jihad. You know, jihad against the nafs, against the soul. Uh, jihad against shaitan. Jihad against your desires. Um, and then, of course, he talks about jihad against... Um, the kuffar, who is part of the, the unbelieving armies that are threatening the Muslim community, and jihad against uh, munafiqeen, who are sort of uh, people within the Muslim society that are uh, spreading seditious ideas. Uh, so he talks about all of that, and I don't want to um, under or overemphasize any of those uh, shades of the meaning. I think we need to look at it holistically. Uh, I do believe that the spiritual jihad is a big part of that, and I would like to emphasize that. But uh, at the same time, uh, armed jihad is a part of our religion, and it has rules, and it has purposes. And I think we need to have a comprehensive understanding uh, and not uh, do like what, what some of the groups out there, they just want to focus on spiritual jihad, or other people just want to focus on armed jihad. And then they're not interested in spiritual topics, and I think that they're they're imbalanced in the in their approach. And I would like to bring some balance back to that if I get an opportunity to write about this topic further. Um, one thing I sense about the article, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it seems to be an article. And by the way, I loved it. Mashallah, it was awesome. Um, Thank it, you. Mark. It seemed to be something that was for specialists or somebody who kind of has a good understanding of how the Sharia works and they're going to be responsible for dispersing that out and put it in their own words or summarizing it uh, to to the average individual that is not a specialist. Um, right. So it, did you have that in mind? Because I think it will answer some of the questions uh, that even uh, uh, Sim just asked you right now. Uh, yes. Um, I, I wrote it at a at a higher scholarly uh, tone and level than I would on my other blog. My other blogs um, posts are pretty simple. I just kind of state what I'm trying to say and I put Hadith there to, to back that up and then I just let it go. Uh, this one, I um, 
was trying to bring more of the history into it and um, deal with some of the sort of the scholarly things. So it was for uh, your 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 uh, undergraduate, postgraduate level educated Muslim to understand, I think, and it was also for uh, uh, Muslim uh, leaders, educated leaders, so that they can understand and hopefully they can synthesize these arguments and restate them in ways that uh, make sense to their uh, constituents. And uh, I, I also had non-Muslims in mind when I wrote it um, because um, this is something that is very confusing to them too. Um, so I, I had all of those kind of groups in my head when I was writing it and I'm, and I was considering that, you know, the people that are reading this are going to become coming from a Western perspective. Yeah. And that's why I kind of started the article out, uh, um, mentioning, you know, these principles of international law and, and a little bit about the history of how the Muslims came, Muslim countries came to accept those. Uh, Justin, uh, let, let me just let me just play the devil's advocate for a little bit, and and just want to hear your responses for for it because some of these uh, arguments kind of come out in discussions, and for the benefit of our listeners, uh, maybe they can uh, draw something from it. Now, a lot of the times uh, when we have this discussion about jihad, uh, the counterpoint will be that oh, you know, during the first four uh, caliphs of Islam, uh, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali. Islam expanded mm -hmm. north, yeah. south, east, and west. Are you telling me that uh, all these places, n none of these people wanted to form a treaty with Muslims at that point of uh, at at this point in history, and um, that all these people um, were enemies and and didn't see that uh, Islam is uh, a, a pretty much a superpower at this point, and they continued wanting to fight. Uh, or fight this great empire that was being built. Well, well if that if what you're saying is true, uh, they would many of these regions would have formed treaties with with the Muslims and uh, not allowed them to be taken over. Well, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, let's talk about the Romans. So there was a treaty with the Romans, and um, according to the Sira, they were the ones that uh, broke that treaty. Um, and sort of proven themselves to be a threat. And everyone knows that they were an ambitious empire and they didn't want a, a budding, uh, strong uh, neighbor with a competing religion next, next to their border. Um, so I believe that the, the, the first righteous caliphs, they were expanding out to remove these threats to the Muslim community because uh, the piece, because the thing is, the, the point I make in the article is that this this is not a peaceful world that the Muslims lived in, and so hmm. before the advent of international law and treaties that we're having today, all states were in a state of war with each other, and all peace treaties were um, temporary, and so this is what Thomas Hobbes called the state of war, uh, the uh, a war of every man against every other man. And so this was the logic, the legal logic under which the, the laws of jihad were constructed. So that, that was dealing with the reality. Now, I pointed out in the article that there were, inst there were specific nations that uh, the Muslims did not attack, such as Abyssinia and uh, the Turks at the time. Um, and this is, there's a hadith that is authentic. Uh, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the Muslims to leave the Abyssinians alone as long as they leave you alone. So there was no um, command to go to kind of uh, to go invade them if they're if they were not threatening the Muslim community. And so I'm saying there is a general principle to be derived from that hadith that there were instances in which a nation was not threatening the Muslims and then they did have peace with those nations. And it was these other nations, the Persians, the Romans, and, and elsewhere that um, were threatening the Muslim community and had long histories of war and had their ambitions to uh, take over and force their religion on everybody. So those threats had to be removed. 
there's one more point and it escaped me. But uh, it may be, well. So one of the things I, I think I took away from the article was that for someone that they had it was at the end of the day. First to summarize your last point, it was a dog eat dog world. Like if you weren't going to be conquering, you would be conquered. Yes. Like it was just that's just the nature right. of the beast, right? Um, right. And then the other thing is like part of the responsibility of Muslims is to allow us that we, that we have a pri- we we emphasize a priority is and Sheikh Amr can maybe comment upon this. There's the maqasid of Sharia. Is it the number one like a higher objective? The issue of preserving one's deen. Yes. And so sometimes you mm-hmm. have to, you take up arms to preserve one's deen. Essentially, that's that ties back into it. Is that uh, more in line in light with what you were talking about, Justin? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there were, the purpose of jihad was to protect the religion, to protect the, the practice of the religion, uh, to protect the lives and the security of the Muslims. I don't believe that the purpose of jihad was to spread uh, a political dominance. That I think that's the, the, the key difference between my view, um, which, which is not really my view. It's, it's the view of several scholars and I've just restated it, uh, that, you know, security, freedom uh, uh, to practice Islam and, and for the safety of Muslims and to protect the rights of people. Also, uh, the Dhimmi, the people who, who, who were living with the Muslims, to protect those people, too. That's That was the reason that they went out and fought and, and, and tried to remove threats. Um, it wasn't political dominance for the sake of political dominance. You know, I don't. I don't believe that Islam is a is a ideologically imperial religion that has to conquer the world. I just I I do not find that in the Quran and Sunnah when I read it, um, and and that I think is 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 one of the key differences that has come out uh, when people objecting to what I have written. So we we see many instances, whether it be on Fox News or other media outlets, or even Muslims themselves have this understanding that. Eventually, Islam has to, you know, reign supreme in the entire dunya. So, and that's sometimes that's that's given to people as an incentive to be patient. You know, whatever's happening right now, the incentive is that all this is going to end one day, and Muslims are going to be, and it's a promise. Some people claim that it's a promise. Where where do they uh, originally get those ideas from? Um, you know, because it's become very popular. Right now, yeah. Uh, so. It's interesting because my I was talking to my wife about this uh, after the article came out. She said, you know, we always, when we grew up, we always knew that Islam was eventually going to rise up again and and, and going to, you know, take over the world, so to speak. Um, the this this comes in, um, I believe, from the the prophecies about the the coming of the Mahdi. You know, there will be a guided caliph, a uh, guided Muslim ruler who will. Uh, who will come at the end of time. And so it's kind of, a, I think that's where that idea comes yeah. from. And, uh, I, I looked into the Hadith of that and I don't, I don't reject that idea. I do believe that there will be a, a righteous Muslim ruler that who will come. I don't know that, um, he's going to conquer the world and, and, but, and, uh, and, and I think that well, one of the intended meanings like, could get lost also that, it could be a natural permeation of Islam that Islam just through human interaction and and people know, getting to know each, each other better around the world, uh, just with the uh, uh, the rise of the internet being that that big the huge tool or that medium to allow Islam to permeate into everyone's household around the world. Um, maybe it, maybe just the fact that. The, the spread of Islam can happen on a more of a, a natural ideological platform, but not necessarily a war platform. Exactly. Uh, could be could be what that hadith is indicating that the Islam will spread, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. I, I think people automatically assume that it's yeah. spreading by war, but there's other mm-hmm. mediums available too that Islam can spread. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and I yeah, think I, uh, also to piggyback on that, I always make the argument. To, I, I, so Justin, I, I, I live in Chicago, but I work in Indiana. So a lot of my colleagues are very blue collar, unionized steel workers, and some of them are the kind of folks that would vote for Trump. And so they're always like, you know, well, hey, Mahin, they literally let me think like, like President Obama's Muslim. And I'm like, well, so, so what if, so what if he was? He's like, he wants to implement the Sharia or he wants to like, they overturn the constitution. I'm like, listen, man. 
let's play a hypothetical situation here. That's, that's kind of what Sim was saying just now. What if everybody in America, on their own accord, just convert to Islam, like or eighty percent do, and they're like, "Yeah, we want Sharia law," and according to the Constitution, that's legal, right? They can like do a lot of that stuff within the framework of the Constitution. Am I wrong? If that were to happen, hypothetical situation. Uh, you're asking me. Um, it wouldn't be constitutional to uh, impose a religious uh, practice on people. Uh, it would be constitutional, I think, to vote for legislation and vote for legislators that uh, put forth laws that were consistent with Islamic values. I think that would be um, within the framework of the Constitution. I mean, you could never force anybody to be Muslim, and you shouldn't anyway. Yeah, I think what Mahin was saying, though, if, if it happens to be that 80% of the people end up being Muslim and they all want the same thing, then naturally I think that's, that's what government's that, that, going to do. That's with anything, though, yeah, right? That's Is, anything, I mean, yeah. that you can... Uh, if eighty percent of the population wants to be communist, they can repeal the con- uh, the constitution and and implement oh, the yeah. Yeah. you know uh, the ideas of Marx and what. But is that is that what you're intending to say? Yeah, more, more or less. That, like, or? yeah, there's no forcing the religion on anybody, but like a lot of what they hear about Sharia law, for example, right? Like, so for example, if enough people wanted it, they could impose like HUD, HUD punishments, right? <laughs> like, th- th- that's a popular one everyone talks. They about. already have HUD punishments here anyway. Yeah, every you know every I mean? country does. But no one wants to talk about. It. Yeah, the firing squad is a pretty dope one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Not to digress too much. We're gonna have to cut that one. Out. <laughs> That's like my personal favorite punishment in America. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I mean, but 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 I I, I think there's a, I see a double standard because there's all this paranoia, especially. I, I watch a lot of right wing media personally. Like I'm amused mm-hmm. by it. I and, I, and it's funny because I tell my wife like, why well, you watch NBC, MSNBC all the time? We should watch Fox News. And the, these alt right and all these other folks, because like for me, I, I'm humored by it. I also like try to understand the other side. But they're always talking about like implementing, like imposing democracy in other parts of the world. So how's that any different mm-hmm. from like Muslims, even though we're not trying to impose a Sharia in other parts of the world? Like, isn't there? Don't you think there's like a double standard there? Uh, yeah, I think you could probably point to a double standard there. Um, I mean, you're. I, I don't really agree with imposing. A political system from the outside, I believe, like what you were saying earlier, natural per, uh, permuta- uh, permeation, natural permeation of, of Islam and of political ideas so that they gain credibility and then can be implemented by consensus and not by force. And I mean, this is why the democracy projects by force in the Middle East have led to failed states and to a lot of violence because you can't impose a political system on people who want something else or have different ideas. So, I mean, I think those are two things. I don't don't want to enforce a, uh, impose a religion on people. And I don't want to impose a political system on people when, when a lot of people are against that, you know, you need to build up a consensus and um, yeah. So that's my uh, Justin, what's the um, what's the main attack that's coming from the uh, the the neo atheist crowd in terms of how they're trying to frame Islam to be? Um, they're trying to frame Islam that that what the ISIS interpretation of Islam is. The, that is the right. correct Islam. And I think w- what uh, a project like Yaqeen Institute is doing is, is trying to tackle this this narrative that, that that's coming from that side, that ISIS is actually understanding Islam correctly and everyone else are is actually sellouts or where, where the watered down, where the liberal version of Islam. So well, what, what, what's the number one um, argument they use in, in trying to say that, hey... Um, jihad is understood by ISIS correctly and not us? Uh, well, this isn't my expertise, but the, the what I do know is that like Sam Harris and uh, the people like him, they are trying to argue that religion generally and Islam specifically and especially uh, tends towards a literal fundamentalist uh, reading and, um, and therefore will always be a threat and and so on. Um, so they, the thing is, they haven't seen that ISIS has thrown out all of the scholarship, almost all of it, 
and they cherry pick the parts that they like and they, they don't have a concept of uh, values that informs their application of law. Um, and you look into their documents, uh, they're, they're quoting hadiths and they're, they're quoting verses and they're not quoting the Mufassirin, they're not quoting the commentators, they're not quoting the jurists who have explained those texts. So, um, I, Justin, I actually did some research when ISIS was rising uh, from their main ideologue, Adnani, and I, I actually read through uh, a lot of his papers and what, how he was justifying uh, things like, you know, burning people alive and just reprehensible things that, that he was doing. Um, and you find that a lot of their justification comes from like, like weird or very, um, minority, yeah, extreme, minority. extreme minority opinions that are, um, like tucked away in like thousands of books. I, that's the only way I could think about it because you never ever heard of some of the explanations that they came up with to justify what they, what they do because, uh, well, what I ended up coming away with that is that anyone can end up justifying whatever they want if they want to just kind of cherry pick whatever whatever understanding they want. You know, do you, did you did you end up um, as you through your research? Do you think we need uh, a modern uh, fiqh of jihad just so that um, Muslims who are living in countries that are being attacked? You know, by by foreign forces. Like, for example, let's just say the Syrian war. For example, as as complex as it is, uh, should there be a, a book of fiqh related to jihad for you know the, the moderate Muslims who are who are fighting an oppressive government? Well, we do need a modern fiqh because fiqh is something that moves forward because the the, the situations are changing and the new questions are coming up, and I do think we need to um, synthesize. Uh, our, our classical framework of jihad within this modern context, within this network of international relations and treaties and so on. I mean, what the, the extremists do is they just, they throw all that UN stuff out the window and then they go back to the classical framework. Well, that, that doesn't work because even within the classical framework, you got to respect the treaties that have been made. So, um, and I know there's Muslims that are out there who are fighting against, um, violent governments and I do think that they need guidance uh, guidance and I, I I I do think that 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 guidance needs to be there I don't I'm really hesitant to to talk about the specifics of any situation because I um there's so much information out there and I I'm not an expert on Syria I'm not an expert on Yemen yeah um, and I I don't know what to say to those people because I just I'm not an expert on that stuff. Yeah, I, I, and but I think that they need they need guidance, they need rules, they need purposes, they need to know when to be restrained in war, and they need to have a clear idea of what the outcome of these things is going to be. How, where is the path to peace? Where is the path to stability? And I think we can draw upon our our uh, classical FIC framework and kind of update it with the new situations so that we can see clearly how are we going to end these conflicts? How are we going to get back to a, to a stable world that we want? Uh, J- Justin, one of the main problems, though, with, with related to the subject is that you can't, uh, well, the scholars in this country and in the world in general uh, are kind of restricted by what they can say and what they can't say before people can uh, before the, their livelihood is basically in, in danger right so i think right. that's why they, they they've kind of uh, they don't even want to approach that subject with a 10-foot pole because of the the fear that comes or the repercussions that can come by actually trying to approach that subject in, a, in an honest manner and yeah they're kind of like against the ropes because they have to weigh out the balances if i do talk about this then i'm completely going to be you know possibly you know alleviated from this right community. And, and, and that but void. if i don't talk about it i can stay with them longer right you know 
But don't you think that that void is now being taken up by groups like ISIS? Oh, it does. It does. Of course it does. Because of our unwillingness. I mean, someone is going to have to take that risk. No, that's right. There's certain things because of ISIS. And obviously, you know, we despise everything they're doing. But there's some benefit that as an effect that came out from them as a side effect is that we have to start talking about things that they're talking about and recapture those concepts that they're talking about. Exactly. Because they ta- they're they taking some concepts that are from Islam and they're they're not talking about it the way they're supposed to be talked about. And no one else is talking about those things that they're talking about, right? And, uh, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll mention some of those, but before we move on, there's something just for our listeners, just to recap on something you said, and I just want to elaborate on that, is that a majority of the scholars, whether they're from the Tabirin, or the you know the ones that that were after the Tabirin, you know the, the generation of the Sahaba or after the generation of the Sahaba, any explanations that they had on fiqh, they never said or they never th- wrote with the mindset that it's going to be forever. After I write this explanation of the Quran and Sunnah, it's going to be forever until the end of time. This explanation, this explanation is for our time. They're writing for their time specifically, or maybe fifty years after them. They were never writing for something that would be. 200 or 300 years even a, a, you know a thousand years after them they were with the mindset of what we've gathered right now based on our surrounding this is how we're going to elaborate on this quran on the sunnah or the saying of the sahabi right because the, when, when when you mention something about updating a new fiqh people don't understand that properly they think that we're just discrediting everything that the scholars have done in the past and we're just going to develop from out of the sky our own our own entire uh, type of fiqh and that's not that's not the situation we still utilize those same principles um, you know in usul from the Quran and Sunnah but we apply it to our time um, and I think that needs to be said because there's a few people that I was just discussing about this even just a few weeks ago and they think that we're trying to discredit everything that the scholars have done in the past and um, you know undermine them and, and come up with our own thing and this, that's not the case here I, I absolutely agree with what you said, and um, even I, it was coming to my mind that Imam Ahmed uh, did not like for his opinions to be written down. You're right. He yes. recorded the hadith, and he wanted you to take from the hadith, and he didn't want his opinion to become sacred. Um, and, 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 and we are not, when we say we want to modernize the fiqh, we're not saying we're going to throw out what they, what they said. We're going to build upon it. Yeah. If we need another solution... We see what they said, and if we have if we have to change something, we can we have to justify that. <laughs> I mean, there are people that they want to throw everything out, and and that's lazy. That's just intellectual laziness. Yeah. Yeah. You have to engage this scholarly heritage and build upon. It. It's like a it's like an edifice. You like you you. you you build on what the last scholar said, and then exactly. you build a consensus. It's like, it's like your late, time. It's like your latest uh, Android or Apple version software that's coming on your phone. It's not a completely redone version that's coming out. It's uh, you know four point two, four point three. It's a building off of this existing framework and adding some more uh, clarity, more explanation to to the modern context. Yeah, and you know, there's something that I know this might be somewhat unrelated, but even word and and terminologies. Yeah are updated and they're different. They're, they're understood differently. Like you said, modern and modernization. If you go to the Indian subcontinent yeah, or even the Muslims here that were, that, that migrated here and you say the word modern Islam, they equate that synonymously to sell out Islam. Yeah. Liberalism. Liberal, yeah. Extreme liberalism. Right. Yeah. But if you say the word right. modern, if you go to Egypt, the word modern, it, you know, like the, one of the selling points, and this is what, uh, uh, um, uh, some of the bro- you know, brother Obedullah Evans, we had him on the podcast. When we were in Egypt, he was talking about this. When you take your kids to Egypt uh, in these Egyptian schools um, and they, they know that you're from the States, they'll tell you everything here is modern. Everything here is modern. That's their selling point. Everything here is modern. You know, everything is here. Everything here is you're going to be you're going to like it because you're from the Western country, you know. Right. Um, and so even terminologies have to be understood by people properly, properly in order to even talk about legality. Even even before we talk about legality, we have to talk about terminologies and how they're supposed to be understood in this framework. Right. So that's how complex yeah. this thing is. It's not so easy that you just snap and everything comes together. Right? There's it, a lot of things that go All this it. happened because of centuries of neglect. I, yeah. I think from the Ottomans um, period, I, one of their main weaknesses was that the whole idea or the concept of uh, closing the doors of Ishtihad and where there was no more room for interpretation yeah. um, regarding current things that are happening in their modernity, yeah. in, their, in the light of what's happening in... In the world at that time, they they kind of closed 
those doors. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was part of the stagnation is that we just decided not to grow. Um, we just decided not to continue moving forward. And then all of a sudden the Europeans are coming with cannons and guns and the Ottomans had are 100 years behind in the, when, when they prohibited the printing press. Right. So I heard yeah, that in World War One, they had the wrong bullets for their guns. Yeah, that, that many of their their battalions and uh, armies were were completely had wrong configurations oh, for no. their equipment. So it was that messed up at that time. Right. Hey, Justin. Before we uh, wrap up this subject uh, about jihad, so this week I actually listened to a um, three hour interview that Sam Harris did with the Young Turks, and oh, he, you sat through okay. the entire three hours. Well, not I broke Sam, it up over a few days. Sam Harris can be monotonous, <laughs> you know. Uh, it was I, I was I was at work, and I, some some of my work tasks can be very monotonous too. So I need something to listen to, like something that's like I I'm really literally doing monkey work sometimes for hours a day. Oh, okay, and I had this playing in the background. But what I gathered from Sam's point of view, and this is why I think a lot of people buy into his argument. He the argument he keeps hammering home is that. Um, that Muslims believe because our, we have a belief in a hereafter and, and then we have people from the past who have said stuff to the effect of we, you know, desire death more than you desire life, right? And this is something that we, we've heard about from the stories of the companions, etc. And so like, I'm like, well, that's true. I mean, that's, that's accurate. I mean, we believe because of our belief in a hereafter. And he's saying, and, but then he reads into it and he's able to convince the, an audience in, in the West which primarily, even if they don't necessarily, either they say they're religious and they believe in a hereafter, it's not like the kind of yakin that I think Muslims have. Right. Right. You know, Pun intended. The, right. Yeah, no, he was, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Uh, so like how, as we're dealing with, um, you know, our, our neighbors here, and, and this might segue into the next thing I wanted to really talk to you about, because you come from a, you know, you're, you're from suburban America, you know, you're Caucasian American. These are like a lot of people that Muslims are afraid of now in Trump's America, you know, with with that's being our understanding. And that's maybe and like it's almost like we can never on that level get anyone to agree with us because no one at the end of the day is going to be like, yeah, we totally see that, you know, where you're coming from because you have this hereafter that you're looking forward to. And this is just a small <laughs> little phase of, you know, existence. <laughs> that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So, like, <laughs> I, I, I guess, like, the, the question the question is. Like, you know, with that understanding in mind, how do we, you know, connect with suburban America, especially in, in the new era of Donald Trump? Um, I think uh, Sheikh Omar has done a very good leading example in this. He's gone to churches, he's reached out to clergy, and he's made alliances with Christians and evangelicals and Catholics and, and Jews and so on. Um, so, and, you know, I used to do some of that stuff too. I went to some churches and I would go to university classrooms, to speak about Islam. And I remember there were people that were, they were afraid and you can tell, and they asked me questions that they, that they're afraid of Islam. And when you reach out to them and you do it in a personal way and you, you do it in a compassionate way, you know, well, heart to heart, one person at a time. You got to talk to those people and they got to know you. They got to know you're a person. They know that you're, you're not out to hurt them. You know, we don't have those relationships with this segment in America. And a lot of that is because they're insulated in rural areas. But um, a lot of those people, they just never met a Muslim, mm. you know, and if they know that down the street, there's that Muslim family, they know he's a good guy. He takes care of his kids. You know, he he uh, he gave me gifts. You know, he smiles at me. If they can meet more Muslims, get more exposure to what real Muslims live like, I think that's the way to do it. It's got to be at the grassroots. It's got to be one to one, heart to heart, person to person, getting to know these people. I don't I don't know that the top down stuff is important as much as the grassroots. You know, one one by one talking to these people and and letting them know what we're like. So that's my thought there. You know, and th th that's a, it's a good, ex it's an interesting perspective because I, I have a coworker. Um, he's not really a coworker. He's like a supplier 
for our company. And so he would, I'd line up his people to do the work in the mill. And I remember a couple of years ago, he had uh, came to my office. We, we were just chatting. He's like, you know, Maheen, before I met you, I thought all Muslims were terrorists. <laughs> like he, he's from, and and I, I wasn't taking it. I wasn't offended. I was like, he, and I kind of joke. I'm like, hey, man, you, you don't, don't get too comfortable. You might want to still, still watch your back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, but we're good friends and stuff. So I, I texted him the other day because I know he voted for Trump. He's like, hey, Eric, man, like, congrats. Now, don't deport me, please. You know, <laughs> and he, you know, so. Uh, but, but, but I, but I think, and I think that's kind of like we we had a show the other day with uh, uh Joe Bradford. We were talking about that how like like I, I I certainly don't buy into this rhetoric to anyone that every white person out there who voted for Donald Trump is a racist xenophobe. No, you know what that's I mean. Not the case, yeah. And oh, yeah. you, you know, and and I, I think part of the problem is that Muslims we don't we fail like we have our own biases like they have their biases. And that, like, I've always felt like we're the nuanced religion, and we should be the ones to be able to, like, kind of, you know, look beyond that. You follow what I'm saying? That's yeah. part of, like, the greater good. That's, you know, part, kind of taking the higher road, so to speak. So Some people just wanted to vote for a president. They didn't agree with a lot of his morals. They just wanted somebody who was straightforward. That's it. They just wanted somebody who doesn't sugarcoat. Some people voted for yeah. Trump. So, yeah, they're not yeah, they're not all. But I think what he's talking about yeah. is is you just need to have human interaction with other people. Right. Pure human, holistic interaction to know that you're, you know, you're dude, you're just like everybody else. You know, you take care of your kids, like you said. You give gifts. You have fun. You know what I'm saying? You go to the park. You play sports. You know, all that stuff. And, and, and the question I have for you, Justin, I know, you're, I know you've been in Abu Dhabi for a few years, right? But you're still engaging right. with your family back back home in Ohio and et cetera. W- what's the perspective you've gotten from your non-Muslim family members or your f- non-Muslim friends um, in, in America? So, uh, you know, I, um, there's liberals in my family who are, of course, devastated. that Hillary cousin lost. And uh, Mike's family on the whole is conservative and um, – we didn't we didn't really explicitly talk about politics during our summer vacation um but you know um my feeling is that they they support trump because he's the lesser of two evils in their in their view as they don't have a high opinion of hillary clinton so um and 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 i know a lot of people are like that and i don't i don't think they're racist i don't think they're bigots i don't uh, I don't think they're bad people, but it's you know it's this. It was not a it was not an easy choice for anybody between these two candidates. I mean, um, it's unfortunate how it went out, but um, you know I never met, I don't know any Trump person that ever was cruel to me personally. Um, you know they're conservative and they lean that way, and that's. This is how the cards fell this time. Right. Now, before we wrap up, I want you to talk a little bit. Of, I know I saw that you have a, a journal article um, about regarding some of the works of Imam al-Ghazali. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, okay, so my master's by research, my dissertation is on the golden rule in Islam, and the technical term for this is the ethics of reciprocity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So um, my dissertation will be uh, how this appears in numerous hadith. It's in the Quran, it's in the tafsir, and uh, it's in the works of Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah and al-Ghazali and, and, and all other kinds of scholars. And I'm just going to try and document all of the times that this idea uh, appears in, in the Islamic tradition. Um, and when as I was researching it, I, uh, I found out that El Ghazali referred to this quite often. And I was like, you know, I can write a 5,000 word journal article about how he uses this rule or this idea in his works. And it was a great, uh, it was a great project because, uh, he, he, when I was studying him, he provided a framework of how this works. So, do unto others as you would have do un- them do unto you. You know, love, uh, none of you has faith until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And as Imam al Nawi said, this, uh, all, the, all of the adab, all of the, the manners are derived from this hadith and three others. Um, but so attached to this idea are concepts of justice, concepts of mercy, um, kind of great ethical themes in the religion. 
And uh, Imam Ghazali, he kind of hit all those points uh, in Ihya Alum al and in some other works that I, that I uh, looked at. And um, it, it was a great uh, kind of experience. And it took, it took 5,000 words out of my dissertation, but uh, I can add this as an appendix. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the idea is that um, at, uh, at the at sort of the core of of ethics is empathizing with other people, putting yourself in another person's shoes, and doing imaginative role reversal. You know, I imagine if I was that person, how would I want to be treated? And of course, this is within the the guidelines of Islam. Um, some people take the golden rule very literally, and, and if you take it literally with no kind of guide, uh, guide, ethical guidance elsewhere, it, it doesn't work. But you, it, it kind of fits as a hub around which these different ethical themes are connected, and it's a tool of moral reasoning, um, kind of like how you can give yourself a fatwa in a situation, like how, how should I treat that person? You know, well, I... You know, I said that about him and I, you know, I really wouldn't like for him to say that about me. So I'm going to go apologize, you know, and it's so and it's also a tool of uh, moral maturing. So the the more you think like this, the more you mature as a, as a, uh, a morally reasoning, reasoning agent. Um, this is according to Kohlberg's um, stages of moral development, a psychological theory. So that's that's kind of it in summary. So I, I hit a lot of uh, uh, themes that El Ghazali mentioned in relation to treating others the way you want to be treated. And um, so once I finish that, I will uh, finish my dissertation, which will be 30,000 words. And then I'm, inshallah, going to adapt that into a book to publish afterwards. No, that's inshallah. a phenomenal resource, man. I think... Uh... Uh, a majority of problems, whether it be marital issues or just your personal issues that you have with people, um, is that we focus too much on the point and not the person, right? And I think that's the essence of mm -hmm. these two, is the person is a lot more important than the point that's trying to be made. Uh, sometimes we get caught up in making a point, and that point makes us lose all of our morals because we're we're trying to make sure the person understands our point, but we're, we're trying to project it on the person, which is far more important than the point, right? So may Allah give you tawfiq in all your works, man. It's, yeah. uh, it's very uh, inspirational. I think the work you're doing is awesome, mashallah. And may Allah increase you in all your good work. I mean, hey, Justin, where can uh, people okay. find sure. more, find out more about you? Where can they connect with you uh, online? Um, so uh, I'm on Facebook. I have my personal page, and I kind of have a, a, an author page, uh, Abu Amin Abu Amin Ilyas, um, and I have my website. Abu Amin Ilyas dot com. How, how do you how do you spell that? Yeah. So A B U A M I N A E L I A S dot com. Abu Amin Ilyas so dot com. My, my, awesome. my daughter is Amina, so I'm Abu Amina, and then Ilyas is uh, the the Muslim name that I've been going by since I converted. Um, so that's my website, and then I have the subdomain the Daily Hadith at Abu uh, dot abuaminilias.com and then that Facebook page I'm posting hadith there every day um, I just translated like three of them today and sourced them and verified them uh, so I, I'm doing that kind of work all the time I'm really devoted to the hadith I love the hadith and finding them and obscure hadith that are buried in the works of the Tabarani and Obehati and so on but they're authentic and I'm trying to get them out there um, so yeah, I would say go to my website or go to my Facebook page. Okay, cool. Um, Excellent. That you can get a hold of me there. All right. Well, Justin, Jazakallah Khair for coming on. I, you know, I know again, in even time in Abu Dhabi, you're trying to rush to a flight. Um, for our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at themadmamluks at gmail dot com. You can also check out our website www.themadmumlooks.com follow us on twitter or like our facebook page if you have itunes please subscribe and rate us five stars you can also find us on stitcher for our special guest uh, justin parrot calling in from abu dhabi and my co-hosts sheikh amr saeed and sim this is mahin signing off for the mad mumlooks assalamualaikum assalamualaikum
Bye.